but uh, we, we will cover the basics here. So you should be good for, most, uh, for the most part here. Um, and then the, the main focus of the presentation, looks like my, I skipped over the agenda. The main focus of the presentation will be um, the bottom four items. Um, I'll be focusing on a draft that, that has um, been, uh, the work has been going on on, on, on that draft uh, for the past couple of years. It's still evolving, but essentially it has been accepted as the guts of what um, EVPN multicast optimizations will build on. So I'll provide an introduction to what that draft, uh, you know, the new route types that the draft defines and what other um, uh, processes, et cetera, are uh, coming forth in that draft. So let's get started with some of the basics. Um, bump traffic. For those of you who are familiar with the multicast, uh, the L2 multicast wor world, uh, BUM stands for broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast. By definition, this is um, uh, multi-destination traffic. And whenever you have multi-destination traffic, concerns about you know, throughput and latency, performance, convergence, all those things come into play. Um, at a, if you, Bump traffic, if you have to think about it in a very basic way, think about an L2 domain and a bump packet, which is a broadcast, unknown, unicast, or multicast, it's just gonna go everywhere in your L2 domain, okay? It's gonna be flooded, right? So that's why I said whenever there's flooding, whenever a bump packet is in question, we have concerns about throughput, et cetera, right? Now, um, EVPN works the same as any other um, L2 protocol, so it, it does involve flooding of bump packets. What we want to talk about is how um, EVPN optimizes this over and above the traditional L2 protocols. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the IGMP snooping, IGMP proxy, all those uh, you know, um, knobs and handles that are uh, available in the traditional uh, L2 protocol, say like VPLS. EVPN integrates very well with all of them. And what we'll talk about today is how EVPN optimizes further. Um, you know, all those existing mechanisms with L2, EVPN optimizes even further. So um, bump traffic flooded everywhere in a L2 VPN domain. The four PEs, um, the four devices that you see on, um, on, on, your, on the screen, they are part of the L2 uh, domain. So when a bump packet, which is sent by the CE, hits PE1, it is PE1's responsibility to propagate it or flood it everywhere. So that's your bump traffic. This is defined in the EVPN base RFC. Uh, if you are interested in receiving bump traffic, you have to send out um, an EVPN route. It's uh, route type three. It's also called IMET or the inclusive multicast route. It's equivalent to your uh, PIM star G. Um, you want bump traffic, you want multicast traffic, you send a star G, you start receiving it, right? Same thing with EVPN. However, in EVPN, you accomplish it with the use of the IMET route or the route type three. So all these four guys on the screen, they'll send IMET routes to each other, which indicates, hey, I need bump traffic for this particular L2 domain. You have a chance to optimize further um, receiving bump traffic for an L2 domain. Now it's the same four PEs, it's the same L2 VPN domain, but inside that domain, you'll see those red and green ovals. Those are um, bridge domains. Now what is a bridge domain? Crudely, you can think of a bridge domain as a VLAN, okay? So you have an L2 domain, and inside that L2 domain, you can have multiple VLANs. Now, um, if a service or a VLAN is not configured on a particular PE, so for example, here, the, the red VLAN or the red bridge domain is just configured on the top PEs, it's not configured on the bottom two PEs. So theoretically, any traffic that hits the red bridge domain that belongs to the red bridge domain need not be flooded to the bottom two PEs, right? This is an optimization compared to the previous slide where there were you know, the four PEs and it was a large L2 domain and everybody was getting every bump packet. In this case, we are able to abstract or go deeper one level to the bridge domain level and control bump traffic within that L2 domain, but now we are at a bridge domain level, you know, the red and, and, and the green. 
how we communicate between bridge domains or how we uh, communicate between uh, the larger EVPN PEs um, is, is controlled by the use of the IMET route. Um, one of the ways uh, to do this, to, to uh, accomplish this optimization of communication between the bridge domains or between the L2 uh, VPN domains is uh, P2MP replication. So what you're seeing on this slide on the top is the most basic way to replicate bum traffic. It's called ingress replication. The onus is on the ingress PE, which is shown on your left. The ingress PE, let's say, has to send packets to three receivers, as, as shown here. The ingress PE will replicate the same packet three times and send it out. So now you have tripled uh, the amount of traffic inside your core by performing ingress replication. If you want to do better, you focus on the picture on the bottom that is using P2MP LSPs. In this case, the ingress PE uh, does not have to do that much of a heavy lifting. It is more optimized. It's not going to send out three copies of the same packet. It's going to send out one packet. And the three PEs inside that gray cloud, these are called bud nodes. So what essentially uh, the, the, the function of these PEs is that as the uh, uh, packet comes in, they decide how many times they want to replicate it. So you have pushed the replication closer to the receiver and hence optimized it. So the difference between the top and the bottom picture is that the top is ingress replicated and the bottom is using P2MP LSPs. This process, this, these procedures are also defined in the base EVPN RFC today. What we'll be talking about, the focus for this presentation, is how to optimize this even further. If I don't have receivers behind any of these three PEs, I don't want the traffic to be flooded to them. And that's what the new route types that we're going to be talking about, that's what um, we'll be discussing. Now, this slide is not really a multicast optimization, but I wanted to talk about this since there's um, always some sort of a confusion around this. This is really a necessity uh, to avoid loops in your access segment if you are using eVPN. I also want to use this slide to introduce the concept of an Ethernet segment. That is a very basic building block of uh, eVPN. The blue oval that you see over there that spans the interfaces between the CE and the PE, that is an Ethernet segment. In this case, since the CE is multi-homed to two PEs, P1 and P2, it is obviously a multi-access segment. Now, if CE1 sends traffic to P1 and P1 sends it to P2 and P2 sends it back to CE1, it is very easy to form a loop in such a case. Uh, traditional L2 protocols, uh, they avoid this kind of a loop by the use of STP or shutting down some ports, that kind of thing. Um, in case of eVPN, since we do have support for multi-access segments, we have the concept of um, a DF. Right? You have a multi-access segment, you um, have a designated forwarder, and um, that guy does all the right things to make sure that loops are avoided. Now, we'll just go into a little bit of detail as to how this is done in eVPN. P1 and P2, um, they exchange um, eVPN routes, auto discovery routes, um, uh, Ethernet uh, segment route. I'm not going to go into the details. But they, they're able to talk to each other, and they decide that they are part of the same multi-access segment. So when they send bump packets to each other, they will be uh, adding an additional label, which is called the ESI label. This label helps to identify the Ethernet segment that the bump packet originated on. So for example, in this picture, CE, uh, C1 or CE device sends um, the packet to PE1. Now, um, if C1 had decided to send it to PE2, we would have less trouble because PE2 is actually the designated forwarder, right? Uh, so the designated forwarder always knows what to do the right thing in terms of loop avoidance and forwarding. But we cannot impose a restriction on the CE that the CE will always only send packets to the designated forwarder. In fact, this is against the spirit of eVPN where we want to be able to utilize all the links between the CE and the PE. So, so really, we shouldn't have to impose a restriction on the CE that, hey, you are only supposed to send to the DF. 
So um, in our case, the C decides that it's going to send to PE1. PE1 has uh, you know, prior exchanged the ESI label with PE2. That's why when PE1 sends this BUM packet to PE2, it's going to slap the ESI label on the packet. When this packet reaches P2, the DF, um, it is the responsibility of the DF to flood it. But when the DF looks at the ESI label and recognizes that this was the label uh, that was assigned to the, bump, uh, to the bump traffic originating on this ESI, it recognizes that it's the same. And that's why it should not forward it back to that multi-access segment. So it's the ESI label um, that kind of breaks, uh, breaks the loop here, right? So this is, again, all part of um, uh, the base RFC, the EVPN RFC. Um, this was the first part of the presentation. These were the basics. Now we'll jump into um, the new stuff. Um, this is currently, like I said, it's, it's work in progress. It's being defined. Uh, it's being supported by multiple vendors. And um, um, I expect you know, work will go on for a, you know, the foreseeable future to, to further optimize what we have started. So um, for the rest of the presentation, uh, we'll divide it into two parts. Um, the big green oval on top is the core domain. We will discuss opt EVPN optimizations in, in, in the core domain. The little green oval at the bottom, again, that is the multi-access segment. Then we will discuss how EVPN is going to optimize the multi-access segment. So it's, it's two parts. There's uh, uh, three new route types defined. For the core, or for the oval on the top, we are going to be discussing route type six. That is the selective multicast route. Um, we talked about the IMET route or the inclusive multicast route earlier. We said that's defined in the base EVP and RFC. It's like a star G join. Now we will talk about the SMET route or the selective route, which is like an SG join if you want to draw a parallel to the PIM world. And that helps optimize EVPN traffic in the core. If you focus on the bottom oval, um, we will be talking about route type 7 and route type 8. These are um, mappings of the IGMP join and the IGMP leave, respectively. So. Um, for route type 6, the, the, the agenda for route type 6 is that it should be able to pull traffic from the core and only send it to those PEs that have a receiver sitting behind. If a PE does not have a receiver sitting behind it, we don't want to pull traffic down to that PE. Route type 6 is what helps us accomplish that, helps us accomplish um, optimization in the core. Route types seven and eight, for those of you who are familiar with MVPN, it's uh, exactly the same thing. In MVPN, um, you know, we map, uh, we convert PIM, uh, PIM state to BGP state, right? Same thing that's happening here. We are converting an IGMP join to a BGP message or an EVPN message. So a route type seven is a IGMP join sync route in EVPN. And all it is is, is a mapping of a IGMP join, a real IGMP join that I have received on my L2 segment. Route type eight is the corresponding leave message. So um, there's, I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details of how, and, and this is pretty standard stuff that works in, in the L2 domain with the traditional L2 protocols as well. Um, the PE, the designated forwarder, has to perform the functions of IGMP snooping and IGMP proxy. So all those things are still in, in play. Uh, the DF acts as an IGMP querier in, in that access segment to keep the IGMP machinery flowing and you know, receivers sending queries, um, converting BGMP, uh, BGP messages to IGMP joins, that kind of thing. So all those things are happening. We'll focus on the EVPN portion of things. So um, to get all this started, one has to advertise this multicast flags uh, extended community as part of your IMET route. So this is again defined in, in, in the base RFC. When you advertise this community, 
you essentially advertise, hey, I'm going to participate in IGMP proxy optimizations, or I'm going to be advertising the SMET route, the three new route types that we're talking about. Um, this is what you need to advertise to get that uh, mechanism going. So uh, let's talk about the join sync route, which is the route type seven. If you look at the, the fields that um, are in the packet um, on the left side of the screen, um, it's pretty standard. You have the, the source, you have the group, you could do IGMP v1, v2, v3. Um, the flags help you uh, specify that. Um, if you look at the top three rows over there, the first row is the route distinguisher. Um, that's actually part of um, every eVPN route. Um, this, the next field is the Ethernet segment identifier. This is the field that helps you identify the multi-access segment which we are trying to optimize, okay? The third row is the Ethernet tag ID. This identifies the bridge domain that we discussed earlier in the presentation. So you have to identify your larger L2 domain, then you identify the bridge domain, the sub L2 domain that we are trying to optimize, and then obviously the ethernet segment identifier. So this is a direct mapping of the IGMP join into the BGP world. Now what exactly is going on here? You have a couple of receivers, the red and the green. Uh, like I mentioned before, there should be no restriction on um, you know, where the joins go. This is a multi-access segment. We should have the opportunity to equally utilize all the links. So receiver one decides to send a join to PE1. Receiver two decides to send a join to PE4. Now, what we need to do is reconcile these joins and propagate them to the DF. And we do this propagation using route type seven. So now the DF is your single point of representation for your multi-access segment and has all the information about all the, the sender, uh, about all the receiver state uh, across that multi-access segment. Once the DF has that state, it is then able to generate a route type six and send it up to the core to pull the appropriate traffic down. Route type eight, exactly similar to um, route type seven that we just discussed, except that it's communicating leave state, right? We talked about the join, now we're talking about the leave. And just like the IGMP leave, uh, this route becomes important in time sensitive or time critical applications. If, you, if your application is not time critical, theoretically, you don't need this route. Your IGMP state will just time out, as it does with regular IGMP, the leave times out. Um, the same thing will happen here. In fact, this route was added later on in, in the draft originally. When it started, it was just the route type six and seven. And then um, for uh, financial applications where uh, uh, the leave is also critical, this, this route was then added. So this is your route type eight, or the IGMP leave sync route. Um, so what's happening here is you have your receiver one. It sent an IGMP join to PE1, and uh, PE1 said, okay, I have to propagate the state to the DF. It sent the route type seven to the DF. Now the receiver decides to leave this group, and it decides that I'm going to send the leave to PE4, no problem, P4 is going to advertise the IGMP leave sync route or the new route type eight and send it to the DF. So now the DF again has all the state about the join, about the leave, and then it can decide to generate the um, SMET route towards the core or not to pull down the traffic, right? So, um, Again, to summarize, uh, we have two new route types which map to IGMP join and IGMP leaves. Uh, the mechanism is similar to what we have in um, MVPN. We convert them to BGP updates. And because they are converted to BGP updates, now you are not sending your IGMP join and uh, leave traffic over the core, right? Every 30 seconds you have something coming in, that's not going to the core anymore because it's all collated at the DF. If the DF has sent the join once towards the core, it doesn't need to do it again if, if, if more receivers join. So you're reducing the amount of bump traffic in, 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 uh, in your multi-access segment and also impacting uh, the core. So that's the use of seven and eight. 
Now we build on top of seven and eight, and uh, we start to utilize route type six. The DF is the only guy that sends out route type six. When it decides that it has receivers um, that it needs to pull state, uh, pull uh, data from, uh, data for from the core, it's going to generate the route type six. The whole point of this route is that if I'm a PE and I don't have any receivers for a particular group, I don't want the traffic for that group. If I send the SMAT route, I see traffic for that group. If I withdraw the SMAT route, I stop seeing traffic for that group. So we'll, um, I think the only thing that I want to point out over here is that you will notice that uh, the packet format is very similar to uh, the route type seven and eight. But again, if you focus on the top two rows of, of the fields, you'll see that the ESI field is missing. Um, in the previous two packets, we, we had the ethernet segment identifier as part of the packet. But we don't over here because we don't need it because now we're dealing with the core. I just need to know that I have a receiver. I don't care which ESI segment it belongs to. As long as I have a receiver, I'm going to need the traffic for it. So um, this route doesn't need the ESI field to be part of uh, the packet. So we'll go over um, just a couple of scenarios. Um, so for example, now I have the red and the green group. Uh, PE2 and PE3 are part of the green group. Uh, PE3 and PE4 are part of the red group. So um, PE3 will send out SMET routes to everybody else inside the L2 uh, domain. For the red group, the same thing will happen, but in this case, because the red group, the receivers are only present on uh, PE3 and PE4, it's just PE3 and PE4 that are going to send out the SMAT route, but they're gonna send it to everybody. Now, P1, which finally is, you know, is, is, is the one that is responsible for sending the traffic out, for sending the data out, it's sending data, it's sending the red data to only those PEs that have red receivers. So if you focus on, on, on the red lines, P1 is not sending the red data to P2 because it did not receive an SMET route from P2. So, um, the base thing, uh, the base method of replication, ingress replication, you want to optimize further on that. You can start using P2MP tunnels. <clears throat> you can further optimize on P2MP tunnels using the um, SMET route. And now, you know, I'm not going into the complications of a bridge domain, you know, how many trees, how many tunnels, a tunnel per BD, a tunnel per EVI, shared tunnels, that kind of things. These are all, um, you know, topics that will need more than 20 minutes. So, uh, but essentially the SMET route is your friend. Um, it's going to help you optimize traffic in, in, inside the core. I want to close with one slide. Essentially, this is uh, food for thought when um, you, know, you go back and um, try to think about how this is actually going to be useful to you. So I'm picking a very simple example over here. We have um, a data center that is an EVP and fabric that is running all these multicast optimizations that we spoke about. Now this data center needs to talk to an external um, network and we need to be able to connect sources and receivers uh, that are part of the EVP and network to sources and receivers that are not part of the EVP and network, which are just part of say a PIM or an MVP and domain. In that case, the gateway, which is sitting at the edge of your data center, um, obviously it, it's able to talk EVPN and also PIM or MVPN. So um, your SMET route in this case, let's say I have a receiver, the blue receiver, sitting inside the data center, but the source is external. It's not part of the EVPN fabric. So what does the gateway do? The gateway converts the SMET route into a regular PIM join and sends it to that external M router sitting up in, in the cloud. And at that point, to that external M router, the whole eVPN fabric just looks like a CE. We have a similar use case um, you know, for the reverse uh, traffic flow in the reverse direction. I have seen use cases where uh, folks wanted to employ a, a gateway for inter-subnet routing. Uh, we haven't even uh, touched um, uh, inter-subnet routing at all. That's when your receiver is, say, in the red domain and your source is in the green domain and you want them to be able to talk to each other, right? They are in separate bridge domains. In that case, um, you could employ um, a gateway. Again, use the SMET route 
uh, to be able to do that inter-subnet optimized um, multicast routing. These are just some of the use cases. Uh, we'll close with uh, some of the reference material that was used. So the first URL up here is essentially what describes these optimizations, your um, route type uh, six, seven, and eight. The SMET route, which is used for optimizations in the core, and then route type seven and eight, which are a reflection of the IGMP join and the IGMP leave, and they help optimize the, the multi-access uh, segment. Uh, for further reading, um, optimized inter-subnet multicast routing, um, that's, um, that's draft lin, that's uh, the last URL. Uh, this is all I had today. Uh, thank you for joining, and we'll open it up for questions. Hi. Hi. Thanks for a great presentation. So the question is on uh, Jeff and Sura NOSH networks. Uh, type 6 origination. So in MVPN, we would have data-driven switch to data MDT. Here, is it bound to DF election? After DF election is done, would you start advertising? What happens on re-election? So, um, so I'm not familiar with the nitty gritties of how it integrates with the DF election, but yes, like I said before, it has to be just the DF that is going to advertise the SMET route. So when re-election happens, election is a dynamic process, would you withdraw SMET route and re-originate it? I, yes, I would imagine, because it, it is, it's only going to be the DF that's supposed to do it, so you can't have multiple guys sending it, sending it out. Okay, thanks. David Farmer, University of Minnesota. Um, we're in the middle of all of this and in the deployment of this uh, EVPN technologies for campus. And we've um, run into the multicast questions, particularly when you're combining multicast with any cast gateway and, and then um, your multi-access mm -hmm. and it gets rather complicated, mm -hmm. um, have, has, the particular, I didn't see any mention of the Anycast gateway kind of issues in, in this, is, is that sort of so in, in the drafts as well? Or? No, it's, it's not in the drafts as well. Okay. That's not, uh, so I think we are working on putting it in, in, in the draft lin, the second draft, so that's okay. something that's still being worked on. Okay. But essentially, I guess your question is how, uh, how traffic is load balanced across those gateways? Is that the? We're, we're not doing the, it for load balancing. We're uh -huh. doing it for resiliency. Okay. So we want any cast gateway for resiliency. Okay, so then in, in this case, you would have any cast DFs or you would have... Um, well, yeah, do you do DFs, any cast any DFs, cast, okay, or how do, you, how do you want to do that? Yeah. Right, right, okay, yes. I, I think uh, that's something, you know, obviously will depend on the architecture. It, yeah. It's a very valid question. Um, like I said, you know, EVPN and multicast in itself, they're complicated <laughs> to begin with but without combining them. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> Any further questions? All right, let's go ahead and thank Disha for her presentation. <laughs> <laughs>